Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Brad Sutton. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for AF Solutions at Boston Scientific, and I'm joined today by Dr. Amin Alamad from Texas Cardiac Arrhythmia Institute in uh, uh, Texas, and uh, we're going to talk about Ferripulse, a really exciting thing here at HRS. Uh, if you've been at HRS, you've seen a lot of Ferripulse, and so um, we'll get right into it. Dr. Alamad, I, I want to talk a little bit about your early experience. We're three months into commercialization in the U.S., we were excited to get early approval for the device. And what's your experience been so far? Yeah, thank you, Brad. Uh, our experience has been really, really great, honestly. We, uh, we've started using it for all of our de novo AFib patients. We've seen that uh, it's a, a pretty safe and uh, reliable, consistent procedure. Our procedure times are very reasonable. And overall, we've been very pleased with the results. We have absolutely no complaints so far. Um, you know, it's interesting as we, we were in the good and fortunate position to have commercialized this device uh, essentially three years ago in Europe. And we saw some interesting trends, notably that, uh, that RF cases in busy centers seem to melt away in favor of PF. Has that been true in your center as well? Yeah, and, and actually that's a really good point because we're in a unique situation now where we, we can actually understand what happened in Europe and see the value of the system understand some of the data and how to improve on what we do. But it's been exactly our experience in, in Austin where our RF numbers have dropped dramatically um, and essentially been all substituted for pulse field ablation with, with Ferripulse. In fact, uh, what's interesting is not only the de novo patients are getting it, but oftentimes redo patients are getting it uh, depending upon that patient's uh, characteristics and type. So yeah, absolutely. I'd love to, to learn just a little bit about your typical workflow. You know, one of the, one of the tremendous sort of value propositions of pulse field ablation is that uh, it's essentially non-thermal or relatively non-thermal, uh, that it's relatively tissue selective. We don't need esophageal monitoring. But maybe you could just take, for folks who haven't touched the system, uh, walk through kind of your typical workflow, what's differentiated about it relative to your traditional workflow? Yeah, so like with anything new, um, you know, when, you, when we first got it, we wanted to kind of mimic what we were doing before. So for our group, for example, many of us were doing two transeptal punctures, doing a map, having a navigating catheter that you would rove around with, and then the therapy catheter, wh whatever that might be. And so we started doing it that way, but over time have kind of evolved to, for example, one transeptal, doing a quick map and then, and then uh, doing the ablation. But from the ablation perspective, we, we've essentially done what we've done before, but a lot more effectively, essentially. So we don't have to worry about the esophagus, which is nice. And so for our group, we, we primarily do the pulmonary veins, and then we will also do the posterior wall, the left atrium, in the vast majority of our patients, and, and can do that fairly quickly and successfully uh, and not worry about the esophagus. So that's been, that's been really good. And are you typically using general anesthesia for, for your cases? Yeah, similar to, again, what we've been doing with RF is we, we use general anesthesia for RF, so we opted to do the same thing with, uh, with this. But again, some of the learnings from Europe might start to come into play in that maybe we, because these procedures are generally pretty short and well tolerated, um, maybe we can start to move towards less and less sedation. But early on in our experience, we just wanted to do what was comfortable for us. And so, yes, we're primarily using general anesthesia right now. Okay. And what about the learning curve? I mean, we, we've spent decades perfecting uh, RF and cryo. What's the learning curve like yeah. for a new operator? Yeah, I have to say it's very fast. Uh, I, I, I think that this is an interesting technology in that it's a little bit less operator dependent and a little bit more technology dependent. The technology does help you if you're, you know, once you get contact, you can deliver. It's actually very, very straightforward and very easy. And I think there's a few little tricks that you need to learn. But once you've learned those tricks, it's actually a very forgiving, very easy technology with a very, very short learning curve. So I'm curious, as you think about, you know, given the safety profile of PFA, relatively reproducible workflows, does, does the calculus change in your mind about who you bring to the lab, when you bring them to the lab? How, do, how does that evolve? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. In, in fact, that's what we're seeing is that when we've looked, for example, at case volumes, they've gone up. And I suspect some of that has to do with taking patients that we otherwise would have said, well, maybe not, or maybe RF might be a little too hard for them or something like that. So, for example, I, the other day, a very healthy 88-year-old guy that I was hesitant to move forward with RF 
And I told him, why don't we wait until we have Pulse Field available? And once Pulse Field was available, he's a fantastic candidate. He's done very well. So I suspect that the types of patients we get on the older side of the spectrum, but also potentially on the younger side of the spectrum, you know, will we'll start to get therapy more, you know, sooner or more often in many cases. Do patients come to the office and ask for Pulse Field ablation? They are now. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. I mean, we will have patients uh, contact us from, from uh, you know, different areas and specifically ask for pulse field ablation. Um, and I think partly because the, the safety record is good. Um, the, the, the procedure is, is established in Europe. And I think what we're seeing now is, uh, you know, we're encouraging them. We tell them, yes, this is a good. This is legit. Yeah. I'm, I'm struck by still, as long as we've been at this, as good as the data is for all kinds of ablation, you know, it seems like the word can never get out enough in the referring physician community. Have you, have you, have you noticed referring physicians thinking about ablation differently? Yeah, that's, a, that's always a struggle. And it's kind of interesting because we have some physicians who will send you anything and everything, and some physicians will hold on and, and, and wait but we're, we're making some inroads, actually, and I think pulse field ablation is helping us because, you know, you can do the ablation fairly quickly, fairly successfully, um, very good durability. Um, and, and I think that they're seeing those results now as, as we get moving with this. They've started to see them initially with the clinical studies, and I think they're seeing them more. So I, I, I'm hopeful that that behavior does change over time. Curious your, your, your thoughts on, on just sort of the, I guess maybe two things, the patient experience, and is that different in any way from, from traditional ablation modalities, and then the experience of the overall yeah. center, your lab staff, uh, the scheduling, et cetera. Yeah, the patient experience has been very good. You know, again, a lower, you know, smaller anesthesia time or shorter anesthesia time, that helps. Um, our patients don't have the pericarditis that they would have potentially with RF, um, they, they recover really, really well, and they feel good. I mean, we're seeing them either later that day or the next day, and they, they're up and around. They're ready to get going. So that patient experience has been good. From a lab staff perspective, they like it. It's, uh, it's a fairly straightforward setup. Um, it's a consistent setup. It's a consistent workflow. So they're happy with what we're doing so far with that. We've had no complaints from the lab staff, which is good. That's great. Um, let's talk maybe a little bit about something that I think is really exciting. You are our, our national PI for a registry called Disrupt AF. Tell, tell us a little bit about what that is and what we hope to accomplish with the, with the registry. Yeah, so I, I think that um, Disrupt AF is, is, you know, I think it's going to be a very important registry. It's a real-world registry of AFib ablation with the Ferripulse system. And I think it's important because it's going to capture how we do things, what we do, and some of the outcomes with respect to patients. So there's diff different levels of looking at the data. So some of this is going to look at patients and not only how they feel, but how they do with respect to their AFib. It'll also look at lab turnaround, lab efficiency, procedural data, how many transeptals, uh, what, was ICE used, was it not used? So we can learn a little bit about maybe making the procedure better, more efficient, It'll look at anesthesia and, and what kind of sedation is being used. And then ultimately also look at some outcomes. So it's going to look at the patient level. It'll also look at the uh, practice or the hospital level. And then lastly, interestingly, it's going to look at the physician level. It'll ask us doctors, how do you feel about this and how have you changed over time? So we'll get a lot of very interesting data from this registry, I think. Yeah, I'm excited to learn about the learning curve and to see how that stacks up relative to our European experience. As you know, in Europe, it's it, it maybe a bit more price-sensitive environment. The majority of the cases done commercially there are not mapped. The majority are done with deep sedation as opposed to general anesthesia. Any thoughts now, you know, call it dozens or hundreds of cases in, however many you have, about uh, maybe just the, the sort of flexibility of the workflow? And, and let's maybe talk about mapping in particular. Is it, is it necessary when you're experienced? Is it something you're going to continue to do? It's clearly not necessary. I, I think that that's what we learned from Europe is that you don't necessarily need to map. Uh, but, and that's kind of interesting that the workflow is very flexible. If you want to map, you can. If you don't want to map, you don't have to. Similarly, it's flexible with respect to anesthesia, as we've seen from Europe, that they use varying levels of anesthesia. So that gives us at least... Uh, you know, the hope and promise that we can try different things uh, in the U.S. 
we do mapping right now, in part because that's what we're used to doing, and we want to see how our outcomes look over time. And hopefully this registry data will help answer how will it look when people don't do mapping or how will it look when we do things a little differently and, and what will that look like? And I think that's potentially very helpful in particular because even though Europe may be more cost constrained, we still have a lot of you know cost pressure on us as well. No question about it. You know, we, we hear a lot about that. And um, uh, as, as we're launching this therapy, it's, it's remarkable to me how tuned in physicians are to t cost per case in a way they, they never have been before. And so, you know, my hope is that the flexibility in the workflow allows, you know, us as a company to meet operators where they are. Um, yeah, and I think that yeah, that's, a, that's really a good point. You can meet operators where they are, but I think the most important thing is really delivering really good patient care, safe procedures, not worrying about the esophagus, and, and getting consistent outcomes. And that, I think, is what we're able to get with this catheter, which I'm really excited about. So we, we talk a lot about... Um, contact? Is it necessary? How, how, you know, how do you assess it? Um, historically, we've used grams of force and algorithms. What's your take on, on Fairwave in particular and sort of the, the way to do it effectively and safely without traditional contact force? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, the, the catheter actually is remarkably stable when you put it somewhere. It really does stay. It's, it's an easy catheter to manipulate and maneuver in the left atrium. That's not been an issue at all. Achieving good contact is actually quite uh, straightforward with the catheter. Now, we believe in ice as a way to look for contact, and that's what we generally will do is we'll utilize ice, make sure we have good contact. It really doesn't take much time. A very quick manipulation of the ice catheter, confirming contact, and then you, you go forward with your ablation. I think that uh, does give you a little bit better results overall. But again, we'll have to see how that plays out over time. I was at a I was at a dinner last night, and and you know again, so many sophisticated operators out there have really perfected a workflow uh, with traditional thermal ablation. For those folks who haven't had the chance to, to to get their hands on the catheter, or maybe skeptical that it's too good to be true, what what sort of thoughts would you impart to them? What advice would you give to them? Um, yeah, I, I I would say you know as you know we we uh, my group and me in particular we do a lot of thermal ablation we've done a lot of thermal ablation over the years we we we've kind of grown up with it in a lot of ways, uh, but once you start using this you realize how flexible versatile consistent it is and how effective it is when you see patients as they come back for their follow ups, I mean it's impressive we are really impressed overall with the results so we're happy. That's fantastic. Well, um, any other parting words uh, for the folks who are watching? No, I think uh, just hopefully we can get some more centers enrolling in Disrupt and uh, get the data and see how we do. But I think it's going to be an exciting time for EP. We're thrilled to bring that, that, that registry online and for your leadership. We appreciate that. And um, for everybody out there, we appreciate the time. Thanks very much. Thank you.